pro forma earnings. Our accounting gatekeepers were silent partners with the managements they were obliged to audit in the acceptance of pro forma earnings, the epitome of the era's financial shenanigans. As Humpty Dumpty might have told Alice, when I report my earnings per share, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, who is to be the master? That's all. And so, for example, Yahoo makes itself the master in this example. Having telegraphed that its expected earnings for the third quarter of 2001 would break even, it reported in the first paragraph of its earnings release that its net income totaled one cent per share, beating expectations. A footnote to the release pointed out that the pro forma earnings figure excludes depreciation, amortization, payroll taxes on option exercises, investment gains and losses, stock compensation expenses, acquisition-related and restructuring costs. The Wall Street Journal reported that investors were encouraged by the news, doubtless pleased that Yahoo exceeded expectations, even though it didn't actually have any earnings. In fact, Yahoo lost four cents per share. Yahoo is not alone. The fact is that in 2001, 1,500 companies reported pro forma earnings, what their earnings would have been if all those bad things hadn't happened, and if all those customary costs of doing business had simply vanished. Ignoring the all-too-real costs of restructuring charges, asset write-downs from discontinued operations, stock option expenses, and research and development systems purchased from other companies, of course, results in the substantial overstatement of the earnings that corporations report. As a result, the gap between reported earnings and operating earnings, before write-offs, got completely out of hand. Yet few voices were raised to challenge this chimera, and operating earnings remains the financial community's principal measure of a stock's value. Enron put undisclosed off-balance sheet items into the headlines. The firm created special purpose enterprises that were not shown on the balance sheet, relying on the loophole that if an outside owner holds 3% of the stock in a subsidiary, neither the debt incurred even when guaranteed by the parent, nor the losses realized, or for that matter unrealized, need to be reported. In retrospect, of course, that failure to disclose was absurd. Let us hope that with our eyes at last opened to the manipulation that is going on, we establish new accounting principles that will eliminate such a huge loophole and require that those hidden liabilities be reflected on the balance sheet. In 2000, one year before Enron, I expressed this view in a lecture at New York University entitled Public Accounting, Profession or Business. Sound securities markets require sound financial information. It is as simple as that. Investors require and have a right to require complete information about each and every security. Information that fairly and honestly represents every significant fact and figure that might be needed to evaluate the worth of a corporation. Not only is accuracy required, but more than that, a broad sweep of information that provides every appropriate figure that a prudent, probing, sophisticated professional investor might require in the effort to decide whether a security should be purchased, held, or sold. Full disclosure. Fair disclosure. Complete disclosure. Those are the watchwords of the financial system that has contributed so much to our nation's growth, progress, and prosperity. Observing those disclosure standards, not merely generally accepted accounting principles, but far more, surely would have helped to prevent the Enron bubble from inflating and then imploding, and spared investors and employees from the fallout. Under those standards, the special purpose enterprises that lie unaccounted for on a firm's balance sheet would have been revealed. Similarly, the revenue assumptions based on projecting commodity prices 10 years out would have been open to challenge by stockholders and security analysts. The wise investor's rule must be trust but verify. But stockholders can only verify what is revealed. 
The Financial Community as Gatekeeper In an earlier era, professional security analysts might have been expected to help fill the void left by so many boards and auditors, calling attention to managed earnings, financial engineering, and auditor complicity. But the sell-side security analysts employed by Wall Street's giant brokerage and investment banking firms proved to be far more interested in making recommendations for buying stocks, good news, rather than recommendations for selling them, bad news. Further, with the outpouring of lucrative initial public offerings during the market mania, many of no obvious inherent value, the pressure on these sell-side professionals to appraise the new issues with grossly excessive generosity was greatly intensified. They put aside their analytical training and joined the marketing arm of their firms, helping not only to sell new issues of stocks and bonds to the public, but to attract new clients who would be prospects for going public. Wall Street was a major participant in and contributor to the financial mischief of the day, and proved to be utterly worthless as a responsible gatekeeper that watched over corporate conduct. We might have expected the buy side to do better. Some 75,000 professional security analysts now ply their trade in our giant financial institutions, including 62,000 who hold the designation Chartered Financial Analyst. But while their mandate is bereft of the conflicts inherent in the mix of investment banking, brokerage, and security analysis in a single firm, these independent analysts apparently succumbed to the mania as well. They set aside their education, their training, their skepticism, their independence, their responsibility, their duty, and often their integrity, accepting, if not aiding and abetting, the financial shenanigans. Of course, as money poured into the funds they managed, they were well compensated for their participation in the mania. In retrospect, it's astonishing that the voices of concern among the members of the money management community were barely raised. Indeed, these managers, like so many others, seemed to develop a vested interest in the short-term price of a stock, heavily influenced by whether or not the company's quarterly earnings were meeting the guidance given to Wall Street and virtually ignoring what the company was actually worth, its intrinsic long-term value, measured largely by its fundamental earning power and its balance sheet. When Oscar Wilde described the cynic as a man who knows the price of everything but the value of nothing, he could have as easily been describing our security analysts during the recent era. Even as institutional owners were participants in the happy conspiracy to inflate stock prices during the boom, so they were leaders in the happy conspiracy of silence in its aftermath. Regulators and Legislators as Gatekeepers On the regulatory and legislative front, our public servants, who might otherwise have served as gatekeepers, were pressed into relaxing existing regulations for accounting standards and disclosure. When proposals for reform came, for example, requiring that stock options actually be counted as a compensation expense, or prohibiting accountants from providing consulting services to the firms they audit, the outrage of our legislators, inspired, if that's the right word, both by political contributions and by the fierce lobbying efforts of corporate America and the accounting profession, thwarted these long overdue changes. Too many of our elected officials abdicated their public duty in favor of the corporations that vigorously advocated their desire to preserve the status quo, and succeeded in large measure because of the pay-to-play standard that has come to dominate the political scene. Two centuries ago, Thomas Jefferson said, I hope we shall crush in its birth the aristocracy of our moneyed corporations, which dare already to challenge our government in a trial of strength and bid defiance to the laws of our country. The recent era of managers' capitalism presents one more example of the consequences of allowing the aristocracy of our moneyed corporations free reign. Rather than taking the risk of blatantly defying our laws, our moneyed corporations took the safer route of thwarting remedial legislation, thereby compromising the best interests of their own stockholders. Stewardship 
the responsibility of the board. Of all these gatekeepers, surely it is the board of directors that should have been the front line of defense. Why? Because it is the director's job to be good stewards of the corporate property entrusted to it. In medieval England, the common use of the word stewardship was religious, the responsible use of the congregation's resources in the faithful service of God. In the secular world of corporate America, the word has come to mean the use of the enterprise's resources in the faithful service of its owners. Yet far too many corporate directors have been placed in positions of great power and authority without a full understanding of their fiduciary duty to ensure that the corporation's assets are responsibly employed in the faithful service of the company's owners. It is not clear exactly why boards turned away from their traditional stewardship role. But it's easy to hypothesize that during an era of remarkable prosperity and a booming stock market, when managers and investors alike were paying too much attention to stock prices and not enough attention to corporate values, directors relaxed their vigilance. After all, corporate profitability, or at least apparent corporate profitability, was soaring, and directors were largely unaware of the growing collusion between public accountants and company managers and the retreat of much regulatory oversight. What is more, the instant wealth amassed by the creators and leaders of new information age companies in a rush of IPOs created great pressure to allow the compensation of CEOs in other, often more mundane industries to run amok. In boardrooms where collegiality rather than dissent remained the watchword and managers controlled the information presented to the directors, it would have been easier than ever for our increasingly prominent and ever more imperial CEOs to dominate the agenda. Indeed, the rise of the term chief executive officer, which itself goes back only to 1950, may well have been a factor in elevating the perceived importance of senior corporate managers, and hence their compensation. But perhaps the onset of the bottom-line society of our age was the most important factor of all in causing the notion of stewardship to recede. As directors turned over the virtually unfettered power to the company's managers to place their own interests first, both the word stewardship and the concept of stewardship became conspicuous by their absence from corporate America's agenda. Managers drove their subordinates to cooperate in the financial engineering of the day. Some 60% of corporate employees, for example, report that they have observed violations of law or company policy at their firms, many that went unchallenged or were handled all too gently. 207 of 300 whistleblowers reported they lost their jobs as a result of reporting violations they observed. In such an environment, the ethical culture that is an important and vital preventative that makes dishonest acts unthinkable gradually deteriorates. When potential conflicts arise between the management and the shareholders, it is the board's duty to be the judicious mediator. Yet, despite the failure of many boards to act as prudent stewards during the great bull market, our society has lionized our boards of directors nearly as much as our vaunted CEOs. Late in 2000, for example, Chief Executive Magazine told us that dramatic improvements in corporate governance have swept through the American economic system thanks to enlightened CEOs and directors who voluntarily put through so many changes designed to make the operations of boards more effective. In particular, the magazine praised a certain new economy company with a board that works hard to keep up with things and working committees with functional responsibilities where disinterested oversight is required, a company whose four highest values were communication, respect, excellence, and integrity, open, honest, and sincere. We continue to raise the bar for everyone because the great fun here will be for all of us to discover just how good we can really be. As it happens, we now know just how good they could really be. The company, so good that its board was named the third best among all of corporate America's thousands of boards in the year 2000, is bankrupt. 
While its executives reaped billions in compensation, its employees are jobless, their retirement savings obliterated. The firm's name now serves as a national symbol for greed, excess, and deceit. Its reputation is shredded beyond repair. Some of its senior executives are in jail, others on trial for their alleged misconduct. The firm, of course, was Enron. Yet the board of directors is the ultimate governing body of the corporation. Directors are the stewards who have the responsibility of overseeing the preservation and growth of the company over the long term. When corporate affairs were overseen by substantial owners, vigilant oversight by other corporate shareholders seemed unnecessary. Even in the recent era, society continued to trust directors to act properly without interference. We relied on directors to do their duty. Yet too many directors failed to consider that their overriding responsibility was to represent not the management, but those largely faceless, voiceless shareholders who elected them. They failed, if you will, to honor the director's golden rule. Behave as if the corporation you serve had a single absentee owner and do your best to further his long-term interests in all proper ways. Indeed, those were the words used by Warren Buffett in his Berkshire Hathaway annual report in 1993, more than a decade ago. As a group, alas, our corporate directors have failed to measure up to that standard.